Hello, Dick. Looks like you've been studying the reference book on hydraulics fundamentals. Sure have, Tech. And this new one on torque flight hydraulics, too. Walt here says if I learn everything in these books, he can make me a torque flight expert in about five minutes. <laughs> well, Walt's been servicing automatics for a dozen years or so. So if that's what he says, I'd bet on it. Whoa down now, fellas. I told Dick once he understands the principles of hydraulics, I can show him how to diagnose torque flight problems without following a lot of blind alleys. Of course, this lesson in diagnosis will take a bit more than five minutes. Well, the session on fundamentals was interesting, and I have no trouble understanding those simple hydraulic systems, but I'm still a long way from understanding those torque flight hydraulic system diagrams. Well, how about that, Walt? You'll have to admit this diagram does look mighty complicated. Yes, it does, Tack. But it's not so tough if you take one thing at a time. The important thing, Dick, is to understand what each component's job is so you'll recognize the most likely cause of trouble when a unit isn't doing its job. Of course, no matter how well you understand hydraulics, systematic diagnosis is important. Besides finding out what needs repair, you want to know why it failed so you can get to the root of the trouble. So, what say we go over the steps in torque flight troubleshooting now? Then we'll take the hydraulic components individually and see how to find the guilty one. Okay, Walt. Where do we start? Your first check is the fluid level and the condition of the fluid. Always do this before you do anything with an ailing torque flight. Why is fluid level so all-fired critical, Walt? Either high or low fluid level spells trouble, Dick. Low fluid level lets the pumps take in air with the fluid. And if the level's too high, the gear train churns the fluid up and mixes air in. Then you get noise problems like pump whine and governor buzz. Since that aerated fluid is compressible, pressure buildup is delayed. On shifts, you get slip and engine runaway, and then a bump when the shift finally comes in. And that's not the worst of it. Air in the fluid from overfill speeds up fluid breakdown. So it's possible even on a low mileage job to have everything varnished up. Why don't you tell Dick how to check fluid level, Walt? Good idea, Tech. First, make sure the fluid is at operating temperature. Next, while the engine is running, push each of the buttons to fill the clutches and servos. Then be sure the fluid level is never above full and never below add one pint. On the subject of dipsticks, I've heard tell of cases where someone stuck the wrong dipstick into a torque flight. Now, the reference book shows you how to tell which dipstick goes with which transmission. Now, how about telling Dick what you learned from the fluid condition, Walt? Discolored fluid usually means an overhaul, Dick. For instance, if the fluid is black and smells burned, something is burned out in the transmission. If there's varnish on the dipstick, there's probably varnish in all the valves, servos, and clutches, too. Nothing but a complete cleanup will put the unit back in order. Milky-looking fluid means that engine coolant has leaked into the transmission. Glycol attacks the transmission seals and friction materials. So, this means reconditioning, too. I see. Now, what if fluid level and condition are okay, Walt? If possible, go for a ride with the owner to find out exactly what his complaint is. You might have to tune the engine to correct a shift complaint. <laughs> you, you could have a bit of trouble explaining a bill for an engine tune to correct a shift problem unless you've prepared him for it. Just a minute now. What's the engine got to do with it? With low engine output, more gas pedal travel is needed to accelerate. This raises transmission throttle pressure, so upshifts are delayed and harsh. And don't adjust the throttle linkage to compensate for engine trouble. Two wrongs don't make a right. As a matter of fact, Dick, throttle valve linkage adjustment should be checked after every tune-up. Yep, it should. But all too often it gets misadjusted during a tune-up. So be sure to check out throttle linkage adjustment on all shift complaints. Misadjustment of the shift cable is another common cause of trouble, too. If the adjustment is off, manual valve positioning will be off. If manual valve position in neutral is wrong, line pressure may be open to either reverse or drive breakaway. Anytime you have forward or reverse creep in neutral, the adjustment is way off. Sometimes the adjustment isn't off enough to cause creep. It's just off enough to cause partial engagement and burn out a clutch. 
So never underestimate the importance of shift cable adjustment. Now, incidentally, there's a simple shortcut test in the reference book that you can make without putting the car on a hoist. That's good to know, Tech. Are there any more adjustments at this point, Walt? Not unless everything pointed to a slipping band. In that case, I'd adjust it. After that, take the car out for a thorough road test. I always check the performance in each range, noting the upshift and downshift speeds and how the shifts feel. Even though the fluid is clear, I'm careful to check for slip in all gears because slipping means band or clutch trouble. If only one clutch or band is at fault, it will slip in every gear it's supplied in. So by observing which gears have slip, you can usually pick out the culprit. How the heck do I remember what's applied in every gear? <laughs> You don't have to memorize anything, Dick. There's a simple band and clutch application chart in the reference book that you can use. Notice, Dick, that the rear clutch is applied in low, second, and direct. So if you have slip in all forward gears, suspect the rear clutch. I got you. And if there's slip in reverse and direct, it's probably the front clutch, right? Right you are, Dick. Now let's see how we can use the chart to track down band troubles. With bands, it's a bit different. But the chart still tells a story. The kickdown band is applied in second only. If it doesn't apply, you don't get a one-two shift. The overrunning clutch holds instead until a higher road speed. Then you get a one-three shift, skip second completely. With a slipping kickdown band, you get slight engine runaway or flare up and then a bump as the one-two shift is completed. A slipping low reverse band shows up in reverse. This band is on in manual low too, but if it slips, the overrunning clutch takes over. You can double check for a slipping low in reverse band by shifting from drive to manual low. If there's no engine braking, the low reverse band isn't holding. So the road test may turn up a condition that can be corrected by a band adjustment. I see. Now, if we adjust a worn band, don't we still have to overhaul the transmission to clean it out? Here's where good judgment comes in, Dick. On earlier models, with an external filter, where only converter fluid is filtered, I'd say yes. But on 1964 models, which have an internal filter, all the fluid is filtered on the way from the oil pan to the pump. So maybe you can save the customer an overhaul by adjusting the band and giving him a fill of fluid. Of course, any time you change the fluid, you should change the filter, clean the pan, and blow out the cooler lines. Now, Dick, if our problem isn't corrected yet, or to verify our suspicions from the road test, the next step is pressure tests. Here's where you really start to get into the hydraulic system. And here's where I really start to get lost. Just what the heck do the pressure tests tell us? <laughs> Keep your shirt on, Dick. They tell you a lot if you know what to look for. There are three line pressure tests that are related to slip problems. These are line pressure at the accumulator, kick down servo release pressure, and low reverse servo apply pressure. Specified pressure reading on any one of these three tests tells you your pressure source is okay. This means you don't have to worry about the front pump or regulator valve. On the other hand, if only one of the pressures is low, there must be a leak in the circuit it's tested in. That makes sense, Walt. But wait a minute. Hey, you wait a minute, Dick, while someone turns the record so we can hear what's on the other side. Now, what were you about to say when someone interrupted you, my boy? I was going to ask if a bad pump isn't the most common cause of low line pressure. Not by a long shot, Dick. All too often, pumps get blamed for low pressure. The more likely cause is an internal pressure leak. Tech's right, Dick. Remember that pressure is created by pumping fluid against a resistance. Even if the pump volume is very low, a tight system will eventually fill and pressure will build up. If pressure is lost, there has to be a leak. Of course, the pump itself can be leaking internally if it's old and worn. This means output volume gradually decreases. The symptom of lost efficiency is gradual delays in engagement, particularly in reverse. The pump can also lose its efficiency suddenly if it's scored from loss of lubrication or from foreign material. 
But then you'd have plenty of other trouble too. So don't be in a hurry to pull the transmission to get at the pump. Instead, look for line pressure loss caused by a stuck regulator valve or a leaking clutch seal. On low mileage jobs, a leaking servo or accumulator seal is a possibility. If a rear clutch seal is blown, accumulator line pressure will be low. This would verify rear clutch slip that you diagnosed on the road test. Occasionally, an improperly installed accumulator seal is broken and leaks, which also lowers accumulator line pressure. Then you also get a harsh one-two shift because the accumulator doesn't cushion the kickdown band. I understand that, Walt, but the kickdown servo release pressure is supposed to follow right behind accumulator line pressure. Wouldn't a rear clutch or accumulator leak lower kickdown servo release pressure too? No, it wouldn't, Dick. You see, the kickdown servo release test checks out the front clutch circuit. The front clutch and rear clutch accumulator circuits are separated by orifices, so pressure loss in one doesn't affect the other. The low reverse servo circuit, of course, is tested independently of the clutch circuits. A leaking low reverse servo seal will give you a low line pressure reading in reverse. Is there a pressure test for the kickdown servo, Walt? The tests don't tell you anything conclusive about the kickdown servo because it's pressurized on both sides in direct drive, Dick. Later on, we'll see how to use the air test for front servo leaks. Now, let's go on to the valves that affect shift timing. The throttle valve is just a simple regulator valve controlled by a spring and reaction pressure. From the story on fundamentals, you'll remember that the spring force determines the pressure the valve regulates at. When the driver steps on the gas, the spring is compressed, increasing spring force on the throttle valve. This increases regulated throttle pressure. Throttle pressure is connected to a plug at the main regulator valve. It assists the main regulator valve spring and therefore increases line pressure. The important thing to remember when testing throttle pressure is this. If line pressure increases smoothly as the throttle lever is advanced, the throttle valve and throttle pressure plug at the regulator valve are okay. If the throttle valve sticks, there may not be any pressure increase until the kickdown valve butts against the throttle valve and forces it over. Then the increase will be sudden. That's clear, Walt. I guess that leaves governor pressure then. Right, Dick. The governor valve is another simple metering valve, except that it's positioned by centrifugal force. If it's stuck in the in position, governor pressure will be too high, causing early shifts. If the valve gets stuck in the out position, governor pressure is vented, and there won't be any upshifts. There are two important indications when you check governor pressure. First, you want a smooth pressure buildup as speed increases. Second, the pressure should vent when the prop shaft stops, so the transmission will downshift. If the gauge reads one and one half PSI or less at a standstill, the governor is vented. That's right, Tech. Now that we've covered throttle and governor pressure, let's look at some other things that can cause shift problems. We'll start with the shift valves. The shift valves are relay valves that are held closed by a spring and throttle pressure and shifted by governor pressure. Throttle and governor pressure values determine the shift points unless the shift valve sticks. Then all bets are off. If there's a burr on the shift valve or dirt in the bore, it will take more governor pressure to shift it, so upshifts will be delayed. Likewise, on downshifts, more throttle pressure will be needed. In fact, you may not get a coasting downshift. Tell Dick about the accumulator and shuttle valve now, Walt. Okay, Tech. The accumulator cushions the kickdown band on the 1-2 upshift, so a harsh 1-2 upshift could indicate the accumulator needs repair. You don't need to worry about understanding exactly how the accumulator works, Dick. Just know what it's supposed to do. The same is true of the shuttle valve. Yeah, I really got lost in trying to figure that one out. <laughs> what you need to know about the shuttle valve is that it connects or bypasses orifices to control shift quality. If I've still got an unanswered shift problem at this stage, I figure on a valve body cleaning anyway. 
and the shuttle valve is serviced the same as any other spool valve. There's one other thing you don't want to overlook, Dick. If the new internal filter gets clogged, it starves the pumps, and that messes up your shifts too. If I get the picture right then, Walt, shifting problems are nearly always caused by sticking valves, provided the linkage is adjusted right. The trick is to find out where the trouble starts. In the valve body, in the governor, or where? That's right, Dick. And if you know what each component is supposed to do, the road test and pressure test should point the finger for you. Right again, Tech. Now, Dick, if you've got this far and still haven't isolated the trouble, you're at least going to have to remove the valve body. With the valve body off, air tests only take a minute. In these tests, we apply the clutches and servos with air pressure. If they apply immediately, the system is hydraulically okay. That means you don't have to get into the transmission unless a piston hangs up. You can easily spot this because the piston won't release when the air pressure is removed. Notice, Dick, how hard this fellow works to keep from opening the transmission? You bet your life I do, Tech. No use of overhauling a unit when all it needs is to have the valve body serviced. And as often as not, slipping and erratic pressure originate in the valve body. For instance, a stuck regulator valve can bypass pump delivery to sump and cause pressure loss. And a stuck torque converter control valve can bypass the pump delivery through the converter and cooler circuit. Also, pressure can be lost by dirt under the ball check valves. Remember that when a clutch or servo isn't being applied, its system is vented so it can't stay applied from trapped fluid. If a check valve doesn't seat fully, it can connect a pressurized system to vent. As I see it then, Walt, slipping shouldn't be too hard to diagnose either. First, you try to isolate a clutch or band by road test. You verify your findings with pressure tests. If the systems are all tight hydraulically and there's no friction material in the fluid or in the pan, the bands, servos, and clutches are okay. Then the trouble is probably in the valve body. You've caught on quick, Dick. Just remember that knowing what the component should do and using a proper diagnosis procedure and a little common sense make torque flight service lots easier than it appears at first. So keep this new MTSC book handy for study and reference. Remember, the better you know your job, the better job you can do for your customers. And that's good job security for us all.